you're really good at talking about anything, as I have witnessed. Uh, the um, the the BAAFF, which is the Boston Asian American Film Festival, relatively recently. So um, to kind of give you an idea of some of the things like that kind of keep popping up because you're so you're so diverse. It made me think about your film. Uh, well, the film you're in, uh, Justice for Vincent. By the way. You're, you're an actor there, but I think you're also more heavily involved also on the side of production as well. Is that correct? Yeah, or? I, I wrote and produced, uh, executive produce and um, starred in it uh, and kind of uh, moved mountains to make this little passion project come to life because wow. we shot it surprisingly in two intense long days. <laughs> what? People you know, it's like a really high quality short film uh, and we were supposed to shoot for three days. We lost a day of production and we had to, things always happen when you do independent film and uh, we managed to knock it out in two long days, which is a bit of a stunner. <laughs> it stunned me because I am like, I mean, I don't want to say the lowest budget film, but it took us, when, when I talk about my documentary film, people are like, <laughs> two, like really three weeks on the road. And then we got like, an hour of these guests' time to be like, it's such a joke. And, yeah. You know? We, documentaries are totally different beast. Uh, but, you know, with, with your, when you're doing a, a dramatic film, um, we knew we were under the gun. So we had a lot of scenes to shoot mm -hmm. and we just had to be really tight with um, our organization. And thanks to the crew and the director, we managed to pull it off. And it's, wow. a, it's a lot. <laughs> Oh my God, let's, I mean, I'd love to dive right into that. And, but as a heads up, some of the areas I really want to also talk about are, I mean, you possess so much of this information. I'm sure people come to you all the time uh, for this, which is making films is one thing, but getting noticed is something else that you attend these events. So you are a marketer, you're writer, producer, you're, you have so many hats on, which many people in the industry don't get to experience, you know, like... You know, it's funny. Um, I look back at my background. I started out in journalism mm -hmm. and then I went off to Hong Kong with my degree and, you know, $2,000 and uh, two suitcases. And I always wanted to break into show business, but my first career break was actually in public relations. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was a PR consultant and uh, kind of on the rise in the corporate world, doors to showbiz start to open up. And I was always cognizant of the fact that um, you always make lens out of lemonade, although that's a bad way to describe a good career in PR, because it was a really good company. It was a great people. We did great, huge events in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, but you harness those skills, and down the road, they always come in handy. Yeah. Like, I wanted to, I should have went to film school, but then the journalism uh, training was so valuable because it taught me how to write it taught me how to um be disciplined with interviews it helped me with my first break in show business which was um as a tv host in mm -hmm. hong kong and then later in singapore so everything you do in life it's kind of funny how um, somehow those tools fall into your um toolkit and you end up using uh, them yeah I mean, yeah. that, that's so interesting you mentioned that because I could name a, a really bunch of other majors I would rather study in school than computer science and math. And like, you know, part of me feels like I wasted a decade in advertising and marketing, but now those are the skills that people are willing to pay for. Plus uh, now when it comes to think about it, like I saved so much money on marketing because I had those skills to build websites, to run events and yeah. it served me hugely. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. So all those young uns out there. <laughs> exactly. Listen up <laughs> to the grown ups. Nothing goes to waste. It's like Chinese food. You can always make a dish out of it. <laughs> exactly. I know. It's so funny. My mom is uh, staying with me for a few months. And then I just watch her cook. Like, oh, the leftovers become new food somehow. I know, right? Uh, it's like, what? Is that peppers <laughs> to the leftover yesterday? And it's like a brand new dish? Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Life is like that. Anyway, yeah. um, you, you lead the, the Yeah, question. sure. Of course, of course. And I just want to make sure that, um, I'm not sure if your uh, wrists are resting on the table. I just want to make sure. I heard some echo sound, staticky sound. I just want to make sure that we're... Uh, uh, oh, really? Sorry. Oh, it's okay. No, I didn't hear bang okay. noises. But um, yeah, so, well, you know, Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thank um, you for having me. 
I'm, I'm really glad that you're here. It took a, a while for us to schedule this because you're a very busy guy who's traveling on multiple continents all the time. Yeah. Um, but I'm, uh, your, your presence, your film, and your, I would say, the panel uh, discussion that ha happened at the Boston Asian, film, Asian American Film Festival a few months ago, really left such an impression on, on me and was you and you know four or five other people and I really enjoy you pinpointing some of the issues that we're dealing with related to the film, but also you have you have this bigger vision um, for kind of Asian American, um, you know, sort of people working in the industry in general. So I, I was really, um, yeah, it was really, I'm really excited to kind of prepare for this conversation. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I have a tendency to talk a lot because I used to be a talk show host. <laughs> I, I so can't wait for you because some people are <laughs> <laughs> some people are like please stop talking no I I really you know there are people who there are people who talk you know I've interviewed people in certain industries let's just say that they're used to having a monologue or kind of stand on the podium and give a speech um, but I've I found what you presented to be very interactive that whatever you said was aiming at the audience and it was i love the fact that you're so transparent and honest like oh, thanks you know yeah. such a like oh mm, you know thing about whether it's journalism which is my original mm -hmm. background tv hosting and now uh acting and filmmaking um you know you have to connect with your audience and people ask me well you you wore so many hats like <laughs> what are you i go i'm just a mm -hmm. storyteller <laughs> i love that title yeah, it's probably the easiest way to sum me up. Just a storyteller, whether I'm writing it, producing it, hosting, acting, something, you know, I'm just telling a, a compelling story, story that hopefully resonates with um, audiences and people. And yeah. uh, you know, honesty is the best policy. And, I, you know, you have a lot of experience in everything you just described, uh, acting, producing, writing, exec executive producing, which I know is a very different role, you know, with money, finance, marketing, a lot of a lot more hats involved for that particular role. Um, and, you know, could you actually maybe take us back to when you worked as, as a journalist? Like you mentioned that that was a degree you didn't quite expect, but- Yeah, you know, I yeah. remember uh, in high school, I had the secret desire, like a lot of <laughs> people to go break into show business, but those kind of dreams you never really, um, dared to utter in a very conservative Chinese working class uh, upbringing. Uh, and I always was good at the arts, writing, English, history. And I joined the student council in high school and I be, was their PR guy. And I thought, this is, I'm really good at this. I should consider going into public relations. And the way to get into PR uh, or communications was journalism school. So I graduated uh, one of the foremost uh, journalism schools in, in Toronto, Canada, and um, thought, well, I, I knew early on that I didn't want to be a hard news journalist. <laughs> I was like tor tormented, like, oh no, what am I done? What am I done? <laughs> and my parents are already upset that I didn't go to med medical school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I graduated and I, you know, I won a scholarship and I was like, it should have, and I won story of the year. I, everyone thought I was going to be this hard news journalist, whether for a newspaper or on television. And it was one of my uh, instructors when he saw me very kind of uh, conflicted. And he says, Lawrence, there's no shame in uh, pursuing entertainment journalism. Cause that was my mm. other uh, Interesting. wish list. And I kind of, took that really to heart and I went off into the working world with a degree in journalism uh, and um, thought well I don't want to be a hard news journalist I want to break into entertainment journalism I love I, as a kid I love like, entertainment and I would sit there with my VCR VCR people that's how far we're going back <laughs> and uh, I thought well my life is going to be like a checklist of dreams um, and I said Checklist A would be PR, so I went off to Hong Kong and I broke into public relations with a wonderful um, uh, company there that specialized in large-scale sporting and entertainment events, and I mm -hmm. kind of uh, helped 
uh, flourished the entertainment division of the PR agency and was meeting a lot of uh, entertainment people. And that was really exciting me. And then I, as I became more and more um, well-known, uh, emceeing press conferences, and, and I did a lot of things. I was writing for my freelance journalism entertainment articles on the side. I was asked to perform in uh, plays. Um, I started to write songs for some of the canto pop singers, English lyrics. Wow. And everything kind of just started to snowball in Hong Kong. And as my PR career elevated, um, the doors to show business started to open up too. Mm -hmm. And somehow, you know, here I was in Hong Kong, this, you know, took things like this foreign CBC kid, Canadian board Chinese, hanging around with like, mm -hmm. <laughs> running into Sandy Lab and Andy Lau and Jackie Chan and all these mm -hmm. crazy people and behind the scenes of the Hong Kong Coliseum and sometimes interviewing them. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes our events would hire them to perform. And then eventually, uh, TVB, the main station there, offered me a job as um, a part-time TV host. Mm -hmm. So here I was leading a dual career as a PR consultant and then part-time TV host and still juggling all those entertainment things on the side. And then the, the, what really opened up was when Singapore found out about me. Um, because I could have stayed in Hong Kong um, to actually become an actor. Even people approached me if I could be a singer, but I couldn't read Chinese and my Chinese has, you know, the accent of, you know, North American accent. So I decided to jump ship to go to Singapore and uh, pretty fast became um, kind of like an overnight TV sensation. I was, uh, became the host of their Showbuzz, their number one entertainment news show. Mm -hmm. uh, I became their anchor uh, in a month. And then a month after that, I became their senior producer. And, and what year was this, by the way? This is like- We're going way back to the late 90s into the 2000s. So it was a good oh, two year, 10 years in Asia. So yeah, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And then I got to um, host it. So, some of the biggest TV specials in Singapore, like Miss Singapore Universe, their Silver Screen Awards, their first National Day event. Um, I was guest starring on shows like Who Wants to Be a Million Sing Millionaire Singapore. I acted in rom-coms, dramas. Mm -hmm. uh, my final gig was hosting Hollywood Square Singapore. Uh, yeah, and then I went back to Canada and I said, well, I have all this experience. Mm -hmm. What can I do in North America as, an, as this Canadian Asian guy uh, who's a TV host slash actor? <laughs> it, was, it was like 10 years have gone by and the doors are still as hard to pry open as, as they were when I, it was really hard still. But, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's, an, that's an interesting transition because I was going to say that, you know, somebody else, uh, oh my God, I, I, I can't believe this name has just disappeared on me. But Donnie Yen, who is, you know, who was born and raised in Boston, yeah, I, um, I don't know him personally, but I know his sister, who has been interviewed on the show, same, you know, kind of a similar experience where he left when he was 18, 19 years old to go to Hong Kong and pretty much stayed ever since. But yeah. do, you think that's, do you think that's a usual path? Is it like, do you think it's a path maybe some of the Asian American actors are kind of forced into because the opportunities are yes. more in Asia? Yeah. I do. I think uh, it was... Back 90s, 2000s, there was a, a huge wave of um, Western Asians going to uh, Asia mm -hmm. to break into show business, whether it was Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Taiwan, wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, all the more power if you were multilingual, if you could mm -hmm. read and speak Chinese, um, all the better. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was because of the lack of opportunities in North America. Mm -hmm. um, I felt that. Um, uh, and uh, if you manage to break it, and then the dream was always to see if you come, could come back to home, North mm -hmm. America, and see if you could get a, a career here, because this is home, right? There, you're always regarded as a foreigner, even, you know, mm -hmm. um, you could be a household name. So and then I, I lucked out, I landed um, a gig called Ghostly Encounters, which is a paranormal mm -hmm. program that I was the series host of, and it was kind of groundbreaking because I was one of the few um, Asian male hosts of an entertainment type program in North America. And that show has been like, the show is like the show, it's like the theme from Titanic. It just keeps going on. It just, it, <laughs> please just keep buying it. And, you know, I've been 
picked up in America, uh, Canada, England, Asia. And, and then um, when I moved to LA, I had that under my belt. And it was really hard trying to um, start from scratch in Los Angeles uh, again. Uh, and uh, which led me to my um, short film that you saw in Boston, uh, mm -hmm. Justice for Vincent. And um, I decided to kind of seize the reins and say, well, if I'm getting lost in the shuffle here and uh, it's hard to cut a break because what happens in the industry is that if you have a lot of credits here, those roles always go to the people with the most credits because they're most recognized and blah, blah, blah. And if you're a newcomer yeah. coming in, it's still very, very hard. You know, unless you have the cachet of someone like Donnie Yen or Jackie Chan or Michelle Yeoh, mm -hmm. breaking into Hollywood is extremely, extremely hard. And, um, you know, relegate it to a lot of um, peripheral roles, which is seem was the norm for um people of color for a while mm -hmm. uh, it's only recently that the paradigm has shifted where asians are now getting um more screen time um yeah. ever since the success of you know crazy rich asians and you know mm -hmm. always be my baby and, and mm -hmm. uh, i love uh, those uh, film. so these kind of things are now mm. have changed but if you're going back in time they weren't there for us so and also even now, right, I think this is one of the areas that you really started to surface and talk about in a very transparent way. It, there, basically there, there is an issue, uh, but you know, I think I'm kind of curious naturally thinking about like, what are some of the solutions possible? Or you know, we as Asian Americans, how can, what can we do to help each other out? Or other people who are not necessarily Asian Americans who are interested in the cause or they're trying to kind of shift the, the paradigm or, you know, what are some of the things that you think we could do or even start to think about differently, like a, from a mindset shift perspective? Um, you know, I think it's your story. It's always the mm -hmm. story, your script. Um, I think it's important to have um, stories that have um, sort of like an homage to your cultural heritage mm -hmm. uh, or your cultural dichotomy, which North American Asians do have, you know, for a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think the stories have to resonate to other mm -hmm. cultures. It has to be a story that appeals, that crosses all cultures. Uh, and I think that's one of the tricks that it, mm -hmm. that'll do it. Um, also, I think it's breaking away from uh, stereotypes. I think. Mm -hmm we're tired of it and i think mm -hmm. maybe you know the people the movie goers are tired of it too if you yeah. just keep feeding people the same schlock it gets mm -hmm. tired really it's boring it's tired you know we've done the martial arts we've done you know all the gangsters and all so you know <laughs> i think when you we're, like we're real we're, we're 360 full dimensional people give us mm -hmm. a chance to tell our stories which is one of the reasons why i did justice for vincent mm -hmm. an adaptation of the vincent chin story because i saw like there was a wave a trend where there uh it's like we went from asians are good at martial arts mm -hmm. uh, and you know gangsters and servient roles subservient roles and <laughs> doctors and then we went into comedy comedy broke the next wave with yeah. crazy Rich asians and i thought that mm -hmm. i still think drama is going to be the next Mm -hmm. um, a door to kick down and I said well I wanted to do a social justice drama from an Asian American uh, perspective um, but at the same time stay true to what what mm -hmm. I just earlier how do we make this story um, appeal to people of all color it's not just an Asian American social justice story it's a social justice story period yeah and that's my thing um, and bankability. If it sells, mm -hmm. as Crazy Rich Asians did, then Hollywood <laughs> gives you more chances. It's all yeah. about Money. show business is a business. If it can be bankable, mm -hmm. that's where yeah. um, when you the profits start coming in, that's when Hollywood shifts. Um, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that because Crazy Rich Asian, I get there's a, their books and you know there are famous writers involved and their you know faces that people are finally familiar um, with. Mm -hmm. But I think you chose a very challenging topic. I think um, justice for Vincent is something that that hits people very hard, but something that you have to you really have to experience and see. And I think we're in a way I feel that we're responsible 
who know the story. You know, and there are people think talk about the difference between the kind of do you forgive versus forget, right? I think, you know, these are part of the stories that uh, it's impossible to forget and should never be forgotten. Mm. Um, you chose a very, I, I find it a difficult, like a challenging topic, whereas mm. Crazy Rich Asian, it's just entertainment. It's me and my girlfriend, some popcorns, and I don't remember anything happened. Other than some good looking girl and guy involved, right? It, <laughs> <laughs> so, and a lot of those cast members are my friends from Singapore. I, I did the red carpet uh, oh. interviews in Hollywood. No, you're right. Um, I had the chance, because I was working actually on a romantic comedy uh, full feature script. Mm. And um, I remember people, my manager at the time said, what? no one wants an Asian romantic comedy. What are you doing, Lauren? <laughs> Don't waste your time and money. <laughs> anyway, we know what happened there. Uh, and I said, well, what's the other story that I, I wanted to do? And it's the Vincent Chu story. And this is a story that's haunted, me, sat in my gut for decades. And, mm. Like, it, I'm not the only writer or filmmaker who has wanted to do this story mm. in a dramatic form. Um, and it, I took the chance to do it. And I, I know it's not um, like a, it's not a documentary and it's not, um, a lot of creative liberties were taken. So it's, it's an adaptation. It's a mm -hmm. docudrama, if you want to call it. So um, I took chances there in, in its dramatic retelling. But it's not an easy topic to talk about because it's mm -hmm. an, a hate crime uh, mm -hmm. perpetrated against an Asian American that sparked the largest um, Asian civil rights movement in America in the 80s. And how do you do that in 15 minutes, right? <laughs> 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 and I was like, oh my God, it was, it was tough. Mm -hmm. um, but when I wrote the script, uh, you know, I, 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 my thing was, what was the message? What's the message? And the message um, was, it's universal. It's mm -hmm. um, a mother's loss is a mother's loss. Mm -hmm. Hate is hate. Injustice in, in, is injustice. And it doesn't matter if you're Asian American um, or, or Jewish or African American, Middle Eastern, uh, Hispanic, um, you know, a hate crime or, or LGBTQ, a hate crime is a hate crime. And that commonality, the undercurrent of, of injustice, and it binds us, to, it unites us together. And I know we're living in politically charged climate right now. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to kind of make a film that pitted, you know, um, Democrats versus Republicans. That wasn't yeah. the point. I think it's regardless of your political affiliation is that um, if you can see that there, the compassion of, mm -hmm. of um, the loss and, and the injustice, and if that can bring people together, regard, you know, re regardless of your party lines, I think that's the way to um, move forward uh, as a society. Mm -hmm. I think the div uh, divisive of society is very, um, I don't know, it's scary for me. It, it's just very disturbing. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just feels wrong. It just feels wrong. And um, it's, so I took a chance and um, so it's been a, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I've been traveling. It's worth it. And you've yeah, done a lot with the film. Mostly. I mean, it's, it's been a year on the road, of film festivals, and, and you know, we've done well. We've won a lot of awards and stuff like that. And I understand that it's not an easy topic. And uh, some of the, you know, I, I'm, my greatest reward of doing a film is when a lot of the audiences, uh, n particularly non-Asian, they don't know about this story. Mm -hmm. And they saw it. And... African Americans have come up to me. Hispanic people have come up to me. Jewish people have come up to me. That, that we didn't know. We didn't even know that there well, were is... hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, like, I get goosebumps thinking about it. And the most compelling person who came up to me, she, goes, and she said, Lawrence, um, I confess, I'm a, I, I harbor a little bit of racism, but your film changed me. I totally see things from a different perspective now. Mm. And that was the greatest reward of the. You can debate the, the facts and the his, historical uh, components of my film and my dramatic <laughs> embellishments and you know, creative liberties. But the fact that it affected people and in that way, mm -hmm. it was the greatest reward I've ever received.
Mm-hmm. Like that was shocking. Someone actually confessed that they were actually kind of racist and this film changed their viewpoints. Mm, interesting. I, will, I know sometimes those moments kind of, uh, you know, you have that brief moment to discuss with some person, somebody. I would love, you know, imagine if you're like, you know what? This, yeah, you said there was a woman, right? In this case, it would be great to grab a drink with her and sit down and it's like, okay, you know, what were you like before? And the, what, you know, how, how did you people, you know, there's some self-awareness courses uh, that, that are taught in corporate America these days. But if people don't have the self-awareness, how do they even know they need to be in a self-awareness course? But this woman realized something deep inside. And she, like you said, she confessed. Um, but, and that's really powerful. That something mm. that was triggered by the film. Um, yeah. I think, you know, racism is... Um it's a diff- strange thing because um, sometimes it's it's like it's, everything is very superficial. It's broad stroke. You hate someone mm-hmm. because of the color of their skin. Yeah, <laughs> like it's so ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, and then often racism is intertwined with economics. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when, during economic hardships, you blame a certain mm-hmm. demographic for. Yeah, the, the you know your di- economic difficulties, which was happening in the Vincent right now, right? Right now, yeah. yeah. It was right it, now. That eighty-two was the Japanese auto invasion in Detroit, compromising the automotive American automotive industry. And suddenly, it didn't matter if you were Japanese or Chinese; you're just seen as Asian. You were seen as a threat. That mm-hmm. broad stroking, that superficial yeah. broad brushing, um, and that happens now too. And um, mm-hmm. so. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that um, my call to arms. But it, it was through the power of film and storytelling that um, you can affect someone. Uh, and like I said, I hope it was the, the compassion and the understanding mm-hmm. um, that you know altered people's perspective. And I'm just glad that people from other cultures came up to me after the film festivals and. Um, we're very, I don't know if grateful is the right word, but very enlightened mm-hmm. by the fact that there was this story that seemed to, that they all said it deserves to be told, like mm-hmm. it, it, the message. And I know right now there's a lot of filmmakers who are probably, are in the works of doing um, a full feature as well. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I mean, all the power to them. I'm, I'd love to do a feature of them of it too, but I don't know who's going to do it, but Mm-hmm. I think whoever does it, um, it's just a wonderful um, opportunity to relay this part of American history, Asian American history. Yeah, absolutely. I, I felt kind of stunned because, you know, you're, you're every day you're bombarded by these so-called news, breaking news. And when I heard the story and I read it and with a ticket in my hand, I'm, I was just thinking like, wow, I've never heard of this story before. Really? I okay. Yeah, I think the reason is my background is a little different because I didn't come to the U.S. until around 2000. And so mm. I grew up in China, in Beijing. Yeah. And, you know, and it's interesting when I shared your film with some of my close friends and I can see that people who grew up here and lived here some, ran a bell, but they, they don't they can't recall many details. Okay. And for me, I, I was kind of clueless. And I felt like being a Chinese person from China that it's like something I really should know. And, mm. you know, I feel like I was being taught a lesson in, in a way that's not just about, you know, that's not revengeful, but it's, it's about understanding history and really deciding what we need to know to move forward. I think that's really um, what we ought to think about. Yeah. I, th- I think the older generation uh, mm-hmm. know of the story, the younger generation, maybe not. I, I, I know there are some, it's taught in some Amer- Asian American um, schools, social studies programs and things like that. But yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm glad that there's like a whole new audience who don't know of this story. It is, you know, I always thought that, it's like, oh, I want to do this Asian social justice story. And I was like, well, mm-hmm. I was sat there. I'm like, people are going to challenge me. Why do you want to do this? And I go, well, there are African American social justice stories and there's a lot of um, Jewish social justice stories. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been native social where's ours like <laughs> where's ours exactly we need to tell ours too right mm-hmm. so that was my 
two cents. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love the, you know, I love the fact that you also um, worked as, show, as a show host and really in many spectrums and like every walks of the entertainment industry because when we think about um, people who are leading the, the charge as interviewers, having their own shows, you know, like there's Oprah, uh, you know, there's Ellen DeGeneres, and there yeah. isn't an Asian person, household name you can point to, to say, wow, that person. You know, we should be watching this person's yeah. show. Yeah. Um, and I, I really try to think it more broadly these days as I am, you know, in my mid-30s now. I'm thinking... It could be you. <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> or exactly. one of us. <laughs> one of us. I, that's actually the kind of the, the theme I have. We'll get our show together. You know? <laughs> well, no, I, you know, I yeah. think, you know, despite the um, <laughs> tense climate that we live in politically and socially um on the flip side it's really there is more diversity mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i just my hope is that the powers that be um stop relegating us to peripheral roles mm -hmm. you know it's like the main host and then the, the secondary host is asian or mm -hmm. the lead actor is white and then the secondary actor is asian when it comes to a mixed cast why can't it be the other way around you know yeah um so that's my hope and i think that part of you asked earlier how can we affect this change i think it's um getting into those positions of, of power whether it's as a writer as a producer as a director Mm -hmm. um and you know that's how you affect change um sorry i'm gonna get off my soapbox here <laughs> yeah, and, and <laughs> am, I think, I talking, am i a bit preachy today <laughs> no not at all but i think there's an uh, there are more opportunities today than ever before of mm -hmm. uh anybody who you know you, i'm sure you heard this millions of times anyone with a smartphone with a computer internet access you can create anything and you know, I have my YouTube channel, I just subscribed to yours and people are stepping up and I don't, I can't, it's so funny, I wanted to write it down, but I learned about this particular production group, start with W, um, but it's an, a completely Asian, Asian American production team and they, I, I remember learning about them also through Bath and came home, I was thinking, oh, they're too young for me, but then I started watching these Asian American stories and you just crack up, like, Guess one is called Guess Her Age. <laughs> it just plays it's from like 14 to 30. To in Bachelor, was that this company? That was really funny. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I have to send it to you. But all of a sudden, it's like I then immediately before I saw the subscriber, because I'm not like a numbers person, I, I thought to myself, you know, they're d very purely Asian American. They probably have like a hundred, you know, 50,000 followers, and there's a cap, there's a ceiling to how relatable they are. And I was surprised to see over 3 million, which is over time. Um, mm. When I first discovered them, it was like hovering around like 100, 200,000. All of a sudden, they're just people who are, their viewers are very diverse. So all of a sudden, I realized there is an interest. Like you said, we're storytellers. And if we tell good stories, that's not just about ourselves, ex exclusively Asian American, there is an audience. And there's yeah. so many proof points already. Yeah. Well, entertainment is like story, like I said, storytelling. If you're making people laugh, if you're getting mm -hmm. people excited, their adrenaline is rushing, or you're making them cry, mm -hmm. you're doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, it's good. And I think those those old schoolers who used to be in, who are in the positions of power, um, mm -hmm. they need to let go of that old way of thinking. That mm -hmm. it's not so much um, a race thing as it is a story. Mm -hmm. thing. you know if yeah. the story is good and it connects and it resonates and race becomes a peripheral it that becomes a secondary thing mm -hmm. and that's what i think we should strive towards is you know to kind of level the playing field yeah yeah i uh, you know i'm curious to kind of maybe check in with you on something that like a project i've been working on which is after I shot my film, which by the way, I am the host and I am interviewing influential people. I travel around the US and I'm proud of it. Um, but that project was supposed to come after the book I wanted to write, which is not exactly like a handbook for Asian Americans. It's about a, uh, a handbook, a book that's filled with emotions, but also tactical solutions perhaps, and you know, suggestions and, and mindset changing techniques for uh, Asian immigrants anywhere in the world. And 
you know, speaking and speaking with someone like yourself, I feel like you've chosen possibly the hardest industry for Asian American to, to break through. But yeah. yet, you know, you grew up in Canada in, you know, I, I, I assume in an immigrant family. What are some of the things now that comes to mind that you, you wish you knew or, you know, all these kind of uh, reflections and learnings I've had <laughs> personally hit me so much in the past five, six years? I would say um, you have to find your tribe. Mm -hmm. find yeah. Fast, young is better. Uh, surround yourself with people who have similar interests and will support you. Mm -hmm. um, and also you have to have the honesty and audacity to say, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then the part, the second part to that is, well, how do I go about doing it? And that means, you know, honing your craft and networking uh, and creating your own projects that, let, that you're doing. Because when you create your own projects, it really is an affirmation of self-belief. Yeah. It takes a lot. Like, people have no idea how much, um, not only uh, time, but just emotional, spiritual energy that goes, you invest in your it's an online talk show, it's a film, it's a, a, a record, whatever. It's, yes, money is always a, a difficult thing. Uh, and yes, the workload is hard because it's like freelance. You're, you know, you have your day job and you, and you got to do this on your, whenever you have free time and then you kind of like have no life. But the hardest part is the emotional, spiritual part of it because it's, you're going against the winds of naysayers, mm -hmm. parents skeptics, friends, you're breaking conformity and you're harnessing this um, uh, engine in you that says, no, I believe in myself. I have a vision and I want to commit to this vision. And for some reason, if, mm, I think if you're sincere, you're passionate and the quality of what you're doing is good, people gravitate towards it. You know, I managed to harness it with Justice for Vincent. Um, I didn't know, you don't know, but the script I wrote is my first film script. I worked, as I said, you know, TV and blah, 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 but I never did film. And I was getting creatively stifled as a TV host and I wanted to act and I wanted to, you know, go into filmmaking. And it was so hard getting a break. So I said, well, I'm in Hollywood and I might as well do it myself. <laughs> yeah. And then calling up a lot of friends and then networking at, uh, events. I mean, our first person to play Lily Chin, Vincent's mother, was such a hard, hard role. The film is, you know, she really is the heart and soul of the film. And I managed to get Elizabeth Sung, who is was the foremost Asian American actress in LA, in America. Uh, mm. You know, and she's been at the Joy Luck Club and numerous other. Yeah, she passed away. I, I saw weeks yeah. before. Weeks before we began the film, she couldn't do it she she got sick and sadly passed away and then her friend Li Chen came to us and uh, through Elizabeth and we were so like lucky yeah and then our, we had a, a stunt guy I sent the script to code blindly mm -hmm. and I remember I ran into him at a hallway once and he was a um, biracial Korean um, Asian American I had no idea <laughs> Uh, what a powerhouse he was this yeah is like avatar game. 2 and yeah, all, uh, avatar yeah. 2 and like wonder woman and i'm like uh transformers and he came on board to help us uh why did he why that. do you think he said yes he said this exactly the same thing i did uh which was there are no asian social justice stories mm -hmm. coming out of hollywood and he was so moved by the script. And he didn't know the story either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he took time off Avatar 2 and to help us choreograph. He took, a, he took a chance. He believed I took a in chance. it, right? Yeah. But it goes back to, you know, when you have that, uh, take that leap of faith mm -hmm. with the right tools in your toolkit, somehow people gravitate mm -hmm. towards you. Mm -hmm something about it i don't know yeah because maybe because is it because lawrence like when we're all human beings at the end of the day we all know where we're going and their documentary is about we should walk each other home right and yet we act as if we are so just such individuals we're so independent from one another we don't need each other but 
perhaps that you're, you've taken the, the leap of faith to tell a story that's never been told before or never even sought to be important enough. Well, it was, there was documentaries going on. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Not a, a dramatic adaptation. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was able to meet some of the people behind those works, uh, which was really moving. And I met a lot of the real social activists involved in the case. So um, I'm sorry, I interrupted your question. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no worries. I, uh, oh, I think I really was thinking about the reason why the stunt, uh, I actually, I, I believe his last name is Brown or? Stephen Brown, yeah. People yeah. think he's white, but he's actually Korean. Uh, yeah, half Irish Korean. Irish and Korean American, yeah. Half Korean. And because you said people gravitate towards what you're doing, perhaps in parts what I'm doing, is that I think people are curious and people that may not have the opportunity or the time or whatever it takes or particular skill sets or the community to thrive. And they want to witness someone else doing that. And yeah. there, it's almost like a, a actual real documentary unfolds, right? You don't know. If this is going to be know. successful. I mean, when you're doing it, you don't think, oh, I'm trailblazing something. You really don't think about these things. I don't think anyone really thinks about it. It's like if it, everyone takes chances. Mm -hmm. You know, this show business, like you said, is the hardest industry because you could take a chance and you could fall flat on your face. Flat, yeah. You could do a wonderful part and no one sees it. Yeah. And it could, you know, it could become a success. You just, there's no guarantee. It's not like a traditional career where you mm -hmm. get a degree, you apply for a job, and then you land one and you're set. Mm -hmm. It's just a constant gamble. Um, but I don't know, I think um, we have to support each other. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I realize that show business is, is really competitive. And it always baffles me when um, there are segments of like, say, uh, the Chinese community, some are really supportive of you and then others aren't supportive because they're competing with you. That always like freaks, that always like confuses me. Uh, and I realize it because the pie is so small for us. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I get it. But then, you know, and then I, it's very different. I remember going to Korean friends film screenings and then the outpouring of community and support. It, it's very different. Every cultural thing has their own dichotomy. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I get that it's a competitive industry. Um, so I don't know. I, I hope that, you know, we are supporting each other. <laughs> well, let's talk about that for a second. It's really fascinating because I often hear as a woman, how come there are not more women truly supporting each other in the corporate world? And I tell them because that slice of the pie is already so small. There are only so few female executives. That's right. why you see women pulling hairs and cat fights everywhere. That they're, it's true. That's it, the reality. It, it is we true. can't even admit it. We can't even talk about it, which makes it even harder, right? Like women can't talk about the fact that they don't have time to get pregnant. They certainly won't have time to raise their children. And that's, the stake is very high. And you keep climbing. You can, you can also fall flat on your face, right? Internal politics, you, can, you get kicked out. But I want to take a second to talk about Parasite real quick because it's... <laughs> <laughs> it just won the Oscar or four. Okay, I before know. we do... Here's a helicopter. Can you hear it outside? Is it bothering you? The noise? You know what? It was the funny thing. I can't hear it right now. There, there's some staticky, staticky noise. I wasn't sure what it was, but there, I was like, is that a heater or air conditioning? It's someone doing like the lawn grass outside. Oh, that's why. I was like, that's not your mind. you pause and edit or no? Oh, well, I, I will no. try to edit it down a little bit, but it's okay. I feel like this is kind of a real, you know, this is like. I try to close another screen. Oh, it's okay. I, I think yeah. I'm going to try to pick it out. It was, it's fairly constant, so it would be harder to edit. But imagine like you and I could be standing in the street right now having a friendly conversation and it's going to be background noise. So um, sure. let it, yeah, let it be natural. Okay. So, I, so this is my confession towards watching Parasite, to be honest, because everyone who recommended the film to me are American, in particular Caucasian, okay? So <laughs> when they recommended the film to me, keep in mind, I grew up in China, I watched Hong Kong films like for the first, oh my God, 20 years of my life. So when I watched it, I was like, my immediate reaction was like, yep, get that, check. It's, nothing surprised me, you know? Like I knew exact. I almost could predict where it was gonna go until let's just say there are some surprises. And it's refreshing for the non-Asian audiences, right? It, no, no I, 
I have the same <laughs> conversation. Like my <laughs> Caucasian friends loved it more than I loved it. I think it was so, a great film. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. But it, it wasn't like, oh my God. But for them, it's like, oh my God. Like, oh my God. Do you, did you know what, I, oh, seriously, people, I heard <laughs> Americans having extended conversations about, you know, the levels of society and like justice. And I, you know, so that, that happened. And I was like, oh, this is cool. I had no idea I was going to win Oscars. And then to see a, a sea of Korean producers and writers on stage, that was stunning because they took up the it was wonderful. I felt so good about it. I love the speech they gave us like the, where this is an, a move. This is a movement. Things are changing. And I sat there and thinking, I watched on YouTube, by the way, because I wasn't really watching it live. And I felt the movement. I felt like, wow, we're Asian and Asian American. This is so great. And then five seconds later, it's like, man, next year better be Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> well, China. we had a crouching tiger moment that we haven't had a North American uh, Chinese. Moment. Yeah. yeah, I hope that happens. You know, it's interesting. Um, I had the same reaction with Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, I yeah. love the fact that it was so successful. And people yeah. from all walks of life, you know, the box office was huge. They loved the film. Yeah, that's and I'm like, but for a Chinese guy watching that story, we've seen that story lied in a ton of Chinese movies. Thousand movies. Times. <laughs> I, li I lived in Hong Kong. It's always like, rich boy brings home the peasant girl and family objects and I go that's you're like this is my life this is what I witnessed times, right? <laughs> I go, yeah. but I mean i that you know for us we micro analyze yeah. it yeah exactly so fact, you know the fact that it's translated into all these other cultural groups I'm I'm happy for it <laughs> so. I know I know as part of that it's like it almost feels trivial even though that's you know that's a kind of a very cruel word to describe that but to us it's it's almost and what also hit me by the way is when i don't remember the, the name of the gentleman who directed uh, parasite and he's clearly famous when he got on stage i felt like he was very sincere uh, but at the same time he gave away a lot of the the, the sort of how he got famous of um several he named several american directors are all sitting in the front row about who recommended his film over the course of God knows how long, could be 10, 20 years. And being named or being picked, the idea of, like you said, people in power, picking someone like us who's still unknown to the audience, that's kind of a way in. And you kind of keep climbing that ladder. And so it really makes me question, by the way, of seeing a film winning Oscars versus, for example, seeing a film, uh, you know, Bath. I, I think about like how much weight we put on whether we should even go see the film where the impact of the film shouldn't be judged based on the awards you know like i don't think it should be based on the environment where you know how many sort of stamps of approval it has received but i think we as human beings got to be you know a little bit just be more self-aware be more conscious of the world we live in and then be, be able to choose content and who we follow more wisely i mean i don't mean to have to give you like such a profound statement but i constantly think about these things because then we keep following the you know we can't cut through the noise of thinking yeah, we are yeah i understand that perspective uh, that's the thing with um hollywood um, yeah <laughs> Those cornflake seals of approval, yeah. they mean a lot um, because it's money. It's a revenue booster. Um, and people are just swayed by that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the consumerism of show business, isn't it, right? And I don't know if there's a, a solution to that. It's really, there's, you know, <laughs> you do a wonderful art piece film that's critically acclaimed who's going to go watch it versus something that starts winning Oscars. I think most people are going to go see the Oscar film. <laughs> That's just the nature of the beast. That's human nature. Um, is it right? No, not necessarily. I mean, you know, but is it the right way to like uh, be uh, a gauge, a barometer to go see a film or not? No, I don't know. It's in, you know what's really funny? You, you flip it on the other side and it's like, well, the Caucasians have been making films all these years. Is it, how refreshing is it for them <laughs> to see their own films, right? They're probably sitting there. I've seen all this again. So oh, when you, it's true. 
right? And then you see an Asian American film or, or African American film, and it, or what you know from a different culture, Slumdog Millionaire. It's kind of like a, a culture. It's a shock to them. It feels so good. It's a culture. It's, it's a, culture. a refreshing shock yeah. to them. And, and so be it. <laughs> let them get shocked. <laughs> let them get shocked. And you're right. I, I didn't even realize that that there are now hundreds and thousands of films on Netflix, Hulu. That if you flip through them, you realize actually like the ones that you end up flipping through are the ones with big household names or you know adam sandler brad pitt like they're films that you've never seen before right realize just like you said uh, and then you think oh, i've seen this oh i haven't actually seen it it's just so similar to like 300 other films that these people have yeah. so you're absolutely right that a lot of the you know the, the signals or whatever is not getting picked up you yeah. know it's also crazy it's like I, I watch a lot of uh netflix and stuff and it's like mm. It's to me. It's a story. If I get hooked in by the story, and then it almost like you realize it's all Caucasians, <laughs> which is fine. And you know, yeah, uh, it's a UK show. You know, whatever. But then you go, wait a minute. Um, uh, different cultural groups could come up with a compelling story and wonderful acting and great directing too. And uh, you kind of like, hmm, <laughs> does it mm. always have to be? You know one race? Can it be a multicultural cast? Like, exactly. I mean, I even see that in animation. I've interviewed people, um, you know, who deliver Big Hero 6 and all. But the, for example, the uh, from a year ago, this sh animated short called Bao, like Bao. Oh, yeah, yeah, Bao. It just made everybody, I mean, I was crying like a bitch. I, I just like, I look around, everybody was crying, you know, people yeah. of all cultures. And it just, it moved me so much to, to watch that. The whole thing was like five minutes. And, and then I ended up looking up that woman who basically produced the film and actually animated all the characters, like the original character designer. And this skinny Asian woman you've mm. never heard of. I follow mm. her on Instagram. Her Instagram has like 50,000 followers. Then I trace back to her origin story. She's only been interviewed a few times where Pixar turned her down several times, did not give an intern internship, or she didn't really get picked. Like so, and it's crazy. And then she, yet this is like one of the, the most successful shorts that is so Chinese. Right. Um, yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's baffling, right? Yeah, it's baffling. It's like, what is happening here, you know? <laughs> oh boy, you're hitting into some difficult, no, you're right. I think, um, as we make these advances into diversity and the landscape is changing, yeah. how hard is it for an Asian American or an Asian from overseas to break into um, the Hollywood industry, showbiz scene? It's still very, very, very hard. It's still hard. Um, it's like you could have the most compelling resume and the greatest work. I still think you will be almost like scrutinized more or second guessed more. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I remember when I first moved to Hollywood, I had this huge portfolio of showbiz hosting. I interviewed all the big stars, George Clooney, you know, Mariah mm -hmm. Carey. And I won a lot of hosting awards and, and stuff like that. And it was like, you meet people in some powerful plate positions in Hollywood. And it's like, but he's Asian. Mm -hmm. And he's a male. Mm -hmm. If he was a female Asian, maybe would take a chance, you know, because the, the babe thing, right? Yeah, and, you know, me. yeah, and this is going back a few years, so I get it. it you know, it, it's it's harder for us. It still is. I don't care what people still like. It's still harder. <laughs> it's always it's harder. Ba the babe effect. Um, yeah, <laughs> and he's male. It's very hard. And with the oh, same, they, they think, well, is he gonna like resonate in the Midwest? <laughs> But this right. is what we think about. Yeah, it's a big deal. The, People watch south, the, the market in the South going to tune in or they're going to mm. turn off, you know, they'd be mm -hmm. So it's, it's a weird thing. I don't know. I think it's, um, I think, I'll, I'll be honest with you, since mm. you're uh, a, sh a host of a show, of your own show, I, I do think it's easier for an Asian woman to break in as a showbiz host. Oh, I think so. I, I know that for a fact. I think it's, you know, the, as a show host in entertainment business, but I, I've been told many times, not just to me personally, but the fact that Asian women have it 
they say, much easier, even living, just everyday life living in North America. Yeah, you know? I, I, I met Connie Chung years ago, and she said, yeah, it was easier for Asian female newscasters or hosts to break in because they were considered like the babe, the China doll. Mm -hmm. And guys, it was always harder. You know, we were relegated to business news or computer technology news or mm -hmm. whatever uh you know it, it, it but it's it's changing i think mm -hmm. crazy rich asians has done a great job um in that um they actually finally cast asians that aren't stereotypically that's true stereotype you know they, they actually had an asian guy my friend pierre with abs <laughs> from pierre punk from singapore and you know mm -hmm. you have uh henry golding who's very leading man and you have you know there was a a, a great mix mm -hmm. we as asians know about it. we we go to china or mm -hmm. hong kong taiwan we see the mix you know we don't just see asians as, but a lot of the white casting people they have a very narrow a lens of what an Asian person is yeah in their perspective which is like no <laughs> I know and then they tend to look very kind of similar to one another and of course every time I go back to Asia and people without me naming names and people recognize these very famous Asian American uh, particular actresses um, they were all Asian people are baffled by how are they picked do do American people find them very attractive because they're not considered very attractive in right. Asia right it's a yeah. very different perspective you know um yeah. you know asian america in asia they love very like pretty boy yeah. very cutesy girl doll but in america they like the more sexy model yeah. types right it's a very different yeah. thing um but i still think but which is again it goes back to the point is like well why is it okay for uh the white acting community to have all types yeah yeah right they can have goofy types caricature types leading man rugged types sexy types but then when the, back in the asians it's like oh no no it's a certain type it's only mm -hmm. a certain type <laughs> so like a couple of types very ethnic or very but you know um uh what, what was the term multiracial mm -hmm. mix you yeah know? but things are changing so we'll see I don't know. Yeah, I'm excited for the change. I, I think it's the change is definitely happening. And it's, uh, yeah, like you said, when the slice of the pie is already so small, how many types can you really fit in there? And, you know, so. Yeah, they tend to go with what sells before, well, just follow the mold. Exactly. Which, yeah, which, yeah. Which kind of sucks. But at, at the same time, um, I think uh, it'll broaden and it'll get better. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, it all goes down to, you know, it's the quality, whether it's the script or mm -hmm. the person's acting or the person's directing, producing, whatever. If the quality is good mm -hmm. and it translates to um, a diverse range of audiences, then I think you're golden. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're, it's funny that we, you know, we're unfamiliar. I, I know we haven't really spent a ton of time together, but I feel like knowing you through different events and watching your film makes me feel like we're we're close. So we're talking in a very honest way. So I, mm. I, that I think it, by nature, you're a very optimistic person. If somebody could see you in, in, a, in a panel, they will feel that right away. And I want that um, to come through. I never know how I'm, how I'm being received. So thank you. No, you're, you're smiling a lot. You're, you know, you're, you're getting to the point instead of dancing. I don't find you kind of dance around an issue. You're like, this is the issue. Let's talk about it. There are some potential solutions they, these things I've tried didn't work. I, I find it really refreshing when people talk in that manner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I, I will, you know, I, to respect your time, what's next for you? How can people find you? Like, what are, you know, what are some of the projects that we like can to get some list? sleep. <laughs> get Seriously, some sleep. a year on the film, more than a year, constantly traveling is really exhausting. And yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to do, probably do some more writing. Uh, I might revisit the, the rom-com that I was working on. I might do a horror uh, script because mm -hmm. um, you know I'm the host of Ghostly Encounters. I have a following there. Um, but I'm okay to... Um, most people who have had um, a film on the circuit and it's one of a lot of work would jump full fledged into acting. I think I might do more writing. Wow. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, uh, that's like your journal journalist roots of uh, writing, writing more. And uh, I think it's also age. <laughs> 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 you realize 
the reins to true power in Hollywood is creative control. I and mean, you're in behind yeah. the scenes pulling strings. So. Yeah, and also not everybody can write. So might as well take advantage of, you know, like your your toolkit, right? Like what you just said earlier. You know, I, I always kind of like, well, I want to do it all. I want to, you know, Oprah's career. <laughs> I want to be a talk show host. And I want to be able to act and I want to, you know, make films too. Why can't What's I? What's wrong that? with that? I think it's just a matter of um, just keep plugging at it and getting uh, more uh, successful and known. Um, mm. You know, America's a tough jungle. Uh, getting that break is really, really, really hard. It's mm -hmm. just hard. It's just, it's, I got breaks in Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, coming to Hollywood, it's harder. It's just harder. It's mm -hmm. just so many people are, are competing. Um, and so, I don't know. I just think that you just have to keep at it. Yeah, well, I, I'm excited to hear uh, what you're going to work on next. And who knows? Who knows through our connections, common connections, LinkedIn podcasts, and if there's anything that we, I personally can do to help you and please let me know. I will be very honored and, you know, this kind of opportunity oh, is always exciting. Likewise. Jeez, I'm so moved. Man, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. No, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate oh, this. It oh, much. this is wonderful. And I, I hope you feel better, Lawrence. I think you're, you're great. There's no, you know, I couldn't even tell that you haven't been sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> now we know who's lying. <laughs> no, because you're like, you're, you can, you're connected. You're, for me, if I sleep three, four hours a day, I, I would not be functioning. I don't think I can respond to questions intelligently at, at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that's, that's been my life, three, four hours of sleep every day. <laughs> you've been traveling. When, when, you, when are you going to stop traveling? It's pretty much. Uh, I think we have our last film festival, maybe this month. Uh, at, at the Chinese theater in Hollywood, and then I'm gonna call it a wrap. And then um, call it a wrap. Yeah. yeah. How, honestly, how many? How often did you have to travel in the past year? Like every other week, or? There was a time when I was going four cities four weeks, and it was exhausting. It would East Coast West Coast. It'd be like New York to San Fran, yeah. and, and into um, you know uh, Philadelphia. It was it was intense. Would you say that actually, do you think it had a obviously very positive impact on the film um, or were like, what was your expectation going in versus like what, what ended up happening at the end of it? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I first did, I, you know, you, you really don't know. And then we started to win uh, um, uh, awards at the beginning a, a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a streak we were winning. Uh, and that was wonderful. Uh, towards the tail end, you know, not, not as much, and, and, but that's fine. Um, my only kind of like, oh, I wish you won a big festival like TIFF or, you know, Sundance that, or, or Khan. That would have been like over the moon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't complain. I mean, we're at about 25 accolades uh, wow. from my first short film that I wrote, produced, and acted in. So I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Oh my, oh my God, God. I, I still funny. I keep promising I'll wrap it up, but I feel like I love some of these like rapid fire questions where like people really want to know these things. And I have some filmmakers following me because of my journey in the past couple of years. But as I, I learned, the marketing process is so expensive, not to mention time consuming because you can't really do much. You can't really do these interviews like we've been trying to, to schedule them um, as easily. So like, do you have to then work organize your own trips and, and, and pay yeah. for your own trip? You do. Most, the very, very, very few film festivals will offer you a stipend. Mm -hmm. Most of it's out of your own pocket. Mm -hmm. And that's a, my a double-edged sword is that if you create a film that is of high quality and starts winning awards, <laughs> you better have a, a big reserve of cash to start traveling. Yeah. <laughs> Airfare on your own, hotel, you know, uh, meals yeah you have it adds it's, up it's very expensive i know a lot of my filmmaker friends towards the end of the year like i can't i can't travel anymore i have no more money i'm so broke yeah, yeah. it's crazy it's also you're doing you're traveling during busy seasons some film festivals may may not be as big but you can't predict there may be a i don't know a football game yeah, going on right want you to 
to show up to be an ambassador for your film. Mm. And they, they do want that input from a filmmaker. Uh, but at the same time, um, it's, it's very expensive. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of know, if you start winning awards, early on or in the middle you kind of like uh oh it's gonna be to see it coming year. and then if, if you're not and then you say okay you don't have to attend every film festival <laughs> you yeah. can hold back a bit that's so, funny but it's expensive yeah it is expensive. Uh, oh i'm so glad to ask these questions it's so it's yes, juicy i love it <laughs> uh, but you know what the best thing about film festival uh mm -hmm. i'm glad i did it uh, is that you, it's actually awards are great and everything like that and um it's really meeting people like you, mm -hmm. uh, building relationships. Mm -hmm. It really, that's the best part. I mean, mm -hmm. some, some festivals I've gotten, made friends for life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and those are the best um, moments of, of the journey. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just seriously, like you said, same thing for me for podcasting is expensive and uh, we're finally able to bring down the cost a little bit and develop YouTube content. but when we go to show up to a city people we interview open up their doors we see their kids and we become you know lifelong friends and mm. you know we follow them to different places i mean i'm thinking of uh all these like cirque du soleil artists that we you know ended up showing up in my film and we're going to see them in germany now it just it like you said it's an incredible feeling to realize it just like you said it's about the tribe it's about the connection and the network beyond anything else yeah right oh can i just say one, one last thing about uh, yeah please it? please I, I got time yeah if the um uh so i i played a civil rights activist in the in in the film and uh most people know uh helen zia who is the foremost um civil rights activist involved in the case and it was a creative decision to um cast myself in it bec uh, because uh, I didn't want to be a replica of the documentary Who Killed Vincent Shin. Um, and it was a calculated decision in a sense that there were a lot of, um, it was a composite character, sort of like it shouldn't be a male or female, that wasn't the point. But there were a lot of also um, male um, civil rights activists behind the scenes that weren't you know, known. Mm -hmm. So that's why I kind of, you know, stepped into that role. But also I stepped into the role because um, uh, I, my acting coach discovered this, is that why did you want to put yourself in that role? And, and I realized that Vincent's mom was um, reminding me of my mom mm -hmm. and her struggles of you know, dis discrimination and she had legal battles, she had a very hard life, was very unhealthy and she was like her protector. And in my role, and if you see me in the film, it's like I'm like the protector and that, it was a subconscious thing that I wasn't even aware about. Sorry, no. you don't have to put that in this one. You can edit that out. No, no, this is very, no, it's very important. <laughs> yeah, because some people are a bit shocked. Like, mm, mm, why isn't a woman there? You know, so that was my, that was a creative decision. I think it's so important that, that I, my favorite questions to ask uh, actors are like, how do you relate to the character? And, you know, sometimes after someone's been in the film, especially TV series for in the US for like 10 years and 100 plus episodes, you, you almost become that person. Like some people say they have, you know, how do, we, how do you separate yourself from the character that you inherited for so long? I just remember when this story broke and I was a student and then um, I was just haunted by it. Like it really yeah. affected me. And I was in like a very white dominated uh, journalism school and I felt such like a cultural misfit yeah. it really just haunted me it haunted me and it just sat with me and I, I remember I said when I graduate from journalism school in Canada I'm going to go off to Asia to be around my own people and, mm -hmm. you know, and there was discrimination in, in, in communications for people like me so I don't know there's a lot of reasons Okay, this is a this is here we go. The point of my spiel <laughs> that we all, if you're a creative person as you are, um, mm. you're motivated to do something that fulfills your soul. Mm -hmm. There's a creative juice. Something is tugging in you. Um, it's like it needs to be fed. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes you're sub. It's buried in your subconscious. You don't even know why mm. you're really really doing it mm -hmm. um, um but there's always um there's always an impetus to there should always be um a pure um heartfelt reason for doing something 
uh, that you um, are going to invest your time and money and resources into doing it. So, I mean, if it comes from a good place, mm -hmm. your place, that's the right project. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to find out kind of why you are doing this. Yeah, it, it's really, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of triggered, obviously, a lot of thoughts because, you know, I don't have kids and it's one, I love to have kids, but, you know, it, they just say it's, it's not as easy as people think. They just snap a finger and you have kids and this is going to be it for the rest of your lives. And because of the situation and kind of uh, that I'm in and watching half of my friends having children and you lose contact with them right away, very quickly, rapidly, I find myself friending people such as yourself and other super creative people who are traveling constantly, creating, you know, film projects and building companies. And they're so fulfilled. They're so happy with what they've done. Um, and, uh, and, and it's just very, it's very rewarding and very clarifying for me to realize that just like there should be diversity in the film industry for Asian actors, I feel like there should be diversity to how Asian immigrants and Asian Americans, Asian people in general, can choose to live the life that, that suits them. That it's okay to, like you said, time and, and your, your financial resources to pursue what you love to do because, you know, Yes, I mean, I think being a parent is just a wonderful thing. But on the other hand, uh, I mean, I didn't even ask you. I, I just assume that you know you're kind of pursuing so much of what you're doing. It's, it just, it just lonely path, girl. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. is. It is. I. I it's very hard. I, I worked as a consultant for, for years and the travel and the stipend and all was sexy for me for two days, mm. literally. And the rest of it was very lonely and, and, and very difficult. Very um, yeah, it really but it's is. worth it to you, right? I mean, I guess, <laughs> but most of my like friends, they're all getting married and stuff like that. And you know, here I am traveling the film. It's like such a foreign thing for them. Uh, Cause mm -hmm. my, a lot of my closest friends are not in show business. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of like at that oddball guy. No, they live vicariously through you. That's what's happening. Right? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, I don't just, I don't know. I mean, you do it because you have to be true to you, right? So yeah. you walk, you know, you take the road less traveled. Mm. And it, it's a hard road, but you do it because you love it. Yeah. And, and you're here for a cause too. I mean, it's not just the film that you produced, but you're here to, to lead a, a life that's very different than, like you said, becoming a doctor or a lawyer. Mm. Like the, the scheduled path, the expected outcome. Oh, um, well, I would get physically sick if I had to do something I didn't love. No, really, like, yeah. oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> muscle spasms. If yeah. I didn't love that, I would be sick. Yeah, that's true. Just, I would be physically ill, so, you know. Yeah, you're doing us all a favor here, so do what you love, and uh, <laughs> yeah, keep showing up for your work, because it's just exciting to talk about, and um, okay. to know that the change is happening. I mean, when, yeah, Parasite, the change is happening right now, well, people like yourself is part of that movement, you know? You don't have to be part of that crew producing that particular film, but I think we're all... I hope so. Yeah. I, you know, we contribute in our own little way. It's, it's a short film. It's not a big, sweeping, major feature epic, but... Well, there are many films under your name, and there are going to be many more to come, so... I hope so. Yeah. We'll talk more again. Yes, for sure, for sure. Well, yeah, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time. <laughs>